1974 was a thriving time for the American avant-garde jazz scene, and one such contributing band was the John Betch Society, who put out an album on the specialty Strata East label that year, now trading for big bucks, and from it the track Get Up and Go. <laughs> This throws us right into the thick of it. Okay. Wow. A bit of a delay on the pause there. Um, maybe it's the heat. Um, the main guy that we're hearing, our namesake, is responsible for the drumming that you're hearing, kind of just a flurry on this. <laughs> Uh, I hear that saxophone, the way it's just like squeezing up and down, just wiggling about. Yes. Okay, those are the tones you're hearing of Billy Puet, who um, has 171 credits according to the Scogs. Now this is bizarre. Um, it says in groups, one of the, the bands they mentioned them having been in, and, and soon after this, I, the Pusset Dart Band. That was a, a Boston area country rock, soft rock band of the mid seventies that. Um, <coughs> Put out a string of albums uh, between 1976 and 79, and are were somewhat uh, noted for being one of a handful of 70s era bands to use a mime, um, or like one of the members painted himself with mime makeup, or maybe it was just maybe that was just their mascot, yeah. <laughs> Okay, now all the piano confetti that we're hearing is brought to us by Bob Holmes, who likewise has about 175 credits to his name on Discogs. Um, no albums under his own name, but a lot of performances. <laughs> It looks like he was involved in a lot of instrumental rock and R&B back in the 50s. Um, yeah, a, a lot of like uh, singles only acts. <laughs> Basically, uh, E. Well, basically, it seems to be like a big um, kind of dusty toss-up between percussion, saxophone, and drumming, really. Some cymbal mist, that whole kind of misty aura of just like dust and debris getting kicked around. <laughs> Now that was quite quite a, a like explosive intro. Nonetheless, I'm, I'm kind of just wondering now: um, are we where to next? <laughs> Largely just improvised, throwing notes around. I, I, I don't hear much um, like a, a, of a reoccur... B basically, uh, monochordal. 
center has shifted to G. Oh, I'm hearing a bit of uh, like cocktail guitar just strewn about in there lightly. What sounded like hollow body electric. I hear that sprinkling, tinkling in the piano mist. Okay, I'm kind of uh, wondering, when are we going to, like, close cadence or something, or... Yeah, so far it's, it's, it's kind of feeling like one lengthy intro. Um, John Betch um, has eight albums on which he co-headlines after this, all from about at least 13 years post-dating the release of this album, and has been in numerous groups, including several uh, Steve Lacey groups. Yeah, he was another avant-garde jazz figure actor around this time, and a dollar brand. Um, the bass seems to be just coming in at select intervals, just throwing in a few notes and then dropping out. Still kind of just an open cadence, kind of like an unresolved passage. And Now, uh, the guitarist is starting to get a little bit more prominent. It almost makes me wonder if he's trying to pull things together and, uh, and bring some thematic cohesiveness out of this. As you like the um, the guitar and saxophone kind of frontal at this point. The constant mist of the cymbals, you know, and the drizzle of the piano. Perhaps the saxist has really emerged as the ultimate star of this piece. The, the bass more felt than heard, but um, crucial to the thickness. <laughs> I'm hearing a theme emerge. And it ultimately was the saxist, it seems, who would pull together. OK, 
Okay, well, uh, let's see where this can go. There's only like about a minute left to go. Na -na, na -na, na -na, na -na. <laughs> to be a bit of um, oh, t title confusion going on here. <laughs> Just uh, resigning to the more open notes of the piano. Right, right then and there. I, I wish there was there was a bit more passages like that, and I, I wish that the theme had come in a bit earlier. And uh, there might be some confusion regarding my files. The last two uh, files in this album file, uh, in this album folder, had their titles reversed. Uh, what we just heard was Darling Gloria. This is Get Up and Go. <laughs> stand-up bass and some chimes in the background, creating once again that kind of drizzly vibe, that dark kind of... You know, like sparkling reflections of water in the dark. this is going, we've actually formed an ostinato. One, two, three, one, two, three. I like that right there, yeah, th this one actually has a thing to it. Wishing I'd done this one first. The, the actual get up and go. I, something about that melody just slightly reminds me of uh, Dave Brubeck. I see him na 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 just really tear it up there. Yeah, he plays, um, on this album he plays alto sax, tenor sax, clarinet, as well as uh, flute and alto flute. Yeah, he, uh, the one um, like brass woodwind player on the album apparently. <laughs> it's kind of strange for like an avant-garde jazz ensemble of this size with um, six members to only have one horn player. <laughs> Thank you. 
those really high notes. <laughs> much wind, wind of the lungs it takes to produce that through the sax. Because I've heard that playing saxophone, like I, I've never done it before, but I've heard that, that it takes like a lot of uh, like energy and strength and uh, you have you have to have a lot of breath for it. It's not just like the tactility of the hand movements. There's a lot more of that. A lot of it is what you put in. I, I wonder, um, well, Get Up and Go seems quite like an apt title. Like the last one, I'm wondering, um, Darling Doria, I'm wondering who Doria might have been. And, and to think that that, that that whole piece was primarily kind of like an open cadence, freeform intro for the most part. That, that only, uh, like, that over the course of like six minutes and 45 seconds didn't really congeal into anything formative until like the final 60 seconds or so. <laughs> I have a feeling that this track is going to maintain the same pace, but uh, the intensity is going to kind of perhaps reach a crescendo. <laughs> It looks like we might get one of those uh, stand-up bass solos, like in the penultimate section. I really like that theme. That, that sax riff. Oh, and the tinkling of the piano, what it's adding there. That is such a riff right there. I, you know, I wasn't actually... Um, this has like taken me by surprise on uh, on both ends. Like the last track, I wasn't quite expecting to be so loose and kind of shapeless for so long. At the same time, I didn't quite expect these guys having like worked through this album a few years ago and, and not really remembering its contents before I um, just remembering kind of basically what it sounded like the style and overall. I wasn't expecting anything to be quite this. Uh, like thematic as the piece we're getting here. I was expecting more just kind of like a dizzying but dense uh, semi-improvisational avant-garde jazz recording with changes, peaks, valleys, dif differing uh, levels of intensity throughout, trade-offs and such. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, now hear the sax like just kind of wiggling low like that. <laughs> Some, sometimes it's those fading notes that are among the best in the whole track and you know as they, as they play as they keep playing and playing and and the producer just in the engineer just fades it out and 
those final little high notes and such that they throw in was last you know fading bits of detail you know makes you wonder how how long the actual plane went and how it actually ended like did they all just kind of gradually like one by one stop playing and to what went quiet or something you know um that was uh the john betch society with get up and go and before that darling gloria two tracks from their 1974 singular album earth blossom released on strata east um it would be drummer john betch's only album as a band leader although he would appear on many other things um throughout the 70s and 80s like albums by um archie shep um henry threadgill marilyn crispo billy bang and a whole lot more and um, most of these players went on and had other accomplishments in their long line of um yeah the the uh the guy um robert lee holmes is an interesting guy Play, played on a bunch of uh Oh, 60s era, looks like uh, instrumental rock that I'm not familiar with. The high tones, like minor label, I'd, I'd imagine, I'd imagine maybe like Memphis area. Uh, a lot of, uh, a lot of seven inches on ref o label. Yeah, Tennessee. Yeah, that's, um, people who are more versed in the soul funk of like the 60s like early to mid 60s and and like it's various like localized and small press might um yeah admittedly not an area i focused on much although i like it when i hear it i've i um i i i devoted most of my research and ear time to like the 1968 to 1986 era uh because i didn't feel I, the more because it's more album oriented which and, and albums were always kind of more my my preferred medium and uh i felt like um like of historians of people who've been kind of overseen and looking after um r b of the 20th century i felt like um the years in which stacks vault were quite dominant i felt like that like that's been getting a lot of attention from other i i, I felt like there were plenty of people out there already kind of looking after that and who've probably made directories and that I can get to at some point when I decide to I, I don't know if I ever um, can pull myself away from my 70s early 80s fixation that is yeah but back to um, the John uh, Betch Society uh, one of many great albums on Strata East to come out in the mid-70s. Um, other examples include the Heath Brothers, Charlie Roos, Cecil McBee, Stanley Cowell, uh, Gil Scott Heron and Brian Jackson, Cliff Jordan Quartet, yeah. Yeah, I have a lot of these. Uh, Pharrell Sanders, yeah. Anyway, Dick Griffin, yeah. For more rubies and sapphires from the uh, John Betch Society album, see the directory of albums from 1974, linked in the description below, for more than 1,100 albums from that great year across the musical spectrum, from uh, jazz funk to spiritual jazz to avant-garde jazz, you know, the whole, you know, basically the full spectrum of jazz going on at the time, uh, to uh, soul, to funk, to uh, the opening notes of reggae and such and onward to like rock and symphonic and bluesy hard rock the mor just all goes on and on more than like about 12 pages on there like and subscribe and follow me on social media and leave a comment if there are any observations you have about the two tracks we just heard the density the improvisation the um, spontaneity of it all which soloist stood out to you and until next time, this is Zarg on the world's most ear travel tronaxmist, signing off.